wonderful uh, presentations by our speakers and a lot of overlap in their comments about um, issues that need to be done to address these issues. We're now ready for question and answer uh, and we will um, like for you to go to the mic, introduce yourself uh, before stating your question and we'll alternate questions in the audience with our web audience. First question. Hi, good afternoon. Um, my name is Jackie Kammer, um, and I had a question in regards to substance use, um, and the last part you mentioned there was um, uh, the personal feedback interventions and how um, you include things like consequences in regards to money and calories, and I was curious if you find that, um, that information like that is actually more effective at keeping people off substance abuse, for example, like, like you were saying, money and um, calories and maybe other kind of social consequences as compared to facts about health consequences? Well, actually, the problem has, I mean, we, we have anecdotal information that the calories work with the women very well, but um, the problem is we haven't really been able to isolate the specific aspects of each profile that that have the effect. I mean, some, some people have done studies where they've only given the feedback about how much you drink and how much other students drink, and they find that that works alone without any other thing on the entire profile. But I haven't seen any studies with, where they've separated out who's, whether you have the calories or you don't have the calories, because we all have so much overlap. In fact, right now, um, I'm involved in a study where we have raw data from 24 different interventions across the country, and we're trying to look at these kinds of mechanisms of change, but we can't, it's almost impossible because, you know, this, this intervention has 9 out of 10 components, and this has 8 out of 10, and then how do you n separate out what's really working? But we're, we're trying that right now. Uh, we'll do a question from our web audience, Tara. Thanks. So this question is for Dr. Corbin, and a member of our webcast audience has asked, what new research would be most helpful for informing future practice development? That's, that's a great question. Um, again, we're, we're in the process of taking on um, looking at the role of emergency departments uh, or trauma units, actually, um, and how interventions can, in fact, impact um, rates of violence. That's like a broad thing because I think uh, what inevitably comes back to us is are we going to be able to decrease uh, homicides in, in whichever city we're, we're in by X percent, which is challenging. And what we're, what we're saying or suggesting is that you look at some of the more proximal measures. Look at sleep quality and quantity. Look at rates of depression. Look at um, um, post-traumatic stress disorder. Look at those things because we do know that those uh, serve as proxies to violent behavior. Hi, um, this one. Uh, I'm Greta Massetti. I'm from the CDC, and um, I wanted to kind of ask a question about um, common pathways, common risk factors, and outcomes as well. Um, I think several of you touched on this issue of kind of leveraging interventions to look at multiple outcomes and, and both the ones that, that you guys talked about but also ones that aren't represented like the increasing rates of suicide among, amongst this population, um, emerging partner violence amongst this population. So if you could comment a little bit on how we can think about ways that evidence-based interventions that we know affect maybe one type of outcome like violence or um, or substance use or STIs might also be looked at from a research agenda perspective so that we can see common interventions to, to prevent, uh, promote health more generally. Thank you. Well, uh, again, I, I think that um, uh, trying to identify common causes to uh, problem behaviors is a very important enterprise, and I think that the uh, success of numerous positive youth development programs uh, at the adolescent level is uh, testimony to that. And so, um, 
I think that's a direction we need to uh, pursue. But again, I'm, I'm, I also feel that it's really important that we recognize that there's a lot of unique variants going on with these individual behaviors and that the strongest approaches are going to be those that, uh, as, as I said, that integrate um, uh, both perspectives into a common, uh, common intervention program. And let me, let me be specific uh, or, or, or give, give an example of the kind of thing I'm, I'm thinking of. I think that we often, in the uh, common cause programs, uh, emphasize um, constructs that essentially make no reference to the uh, risk behavior that we're looking at. And uh, in, uh, i.e., they're content free, so to speak. So something like emotion regulation uh, is something that is not tied to a specific area, or sensation seeking is not tied to a specific area. And uh, in social psychology, there is um, a ton of research that shows that uh, as you take variable, general variables, and you make them more specific, tied to a problem area, that you'll generally do better in terms of prediction uh, and in terms of ability to predict the behaviors. So for example, in the area of sexual risk taking, they find that sensation seeking, indices of sensation seeking predict sexual risk behavior. But uh, researchers who have uh, uh, developed uh, constructs surrounding sexual sensation seeking and have taken that general construct and made it a little more specific, they generally get much higher correlations than the general ones. So kind of a unified approach would be one where you say we take this principle of specificity and we bring it to bear in the uh, uh, common cause programs and think about what features of an environment uh, are directly relevant to the behavior that we're trying to focus on um, and maybe adapt some of them in that way. So again, I, I think those who work on specific behavior problems need to step back and take a broader, bigger view of what are the common determinants and how are those shaping these things. But I also think those who work with the uh, more general constructs could benefit by thinking through how can we make these more specific and tied to the behavior. And it's, I ultimately think that our best efforts are going to be some combination of the two. And just going one way or the other, we're not going to be as effective. And I just wanted to add one thing, and that is that we know, for example, that heavy drinking is related to suicide and violence and, you know, intimate partner violence and uh, unsafe sex. So in a sense, if um, it's, it's not like having interventions for all of these things, but if we have interventions that reduce heavy drinking, then we will have an effect on these other problem behaviors to some degree. And in fact, uh, we, we're just looking at uh, reductions in drinking. Students who are reducing their drinking are also reducing their marijuana use. So even though we have interventions specifically designed for alcohol, we're having an effect on other drug use. And I think we would have an effect on other problem behaviors as well. I'm just going to add, I think in, in from, from where I've been working, I see that um, a broad, broad broad perspective is important as well. So I, I mentioned a couple of times about trauma and its influence on, on many things. And I, I don't know that there's a lot of studies that have looked at that issue. And I, and I, would, I would focus that on, on a subpopulation that I'm, I'm particularly interested in. That's of African American boys and men of, oh, African American boys and men or boys and men of color. Shall we take another question from the web, Tarrant no more? Dr. Steinberg. Um, I, I want to see if we can tie together some of the findings presented here with some of the discussion um, this morning about cohort changes in the nature of the transition from adolescence into adulthood. Um, although Ted didn't talk about the age curve with respect to violence, it's very similar to, with, to what we see with respect to 
sexual risk taking in with respect to uh, substance use and abuse. So that is that, that after, after these behaviors peak, sometime in the early 20s, let's say, they then start to decline um, you know, pretty linearly until people are 30 or so. Um, and the conventional explanation for that has been that as people move into the roles of full-time employee and spouse and parent, um, these behaviors become incompatible with exercising those roles um, effectively. Whether, that's, whether that conventional explanation is right or not, let's not address that yet. But if, if the, the transition into those roles is now taking place at a later age, would we expect it to take longer for these behaviors that you three have discussed to taper off? Um, and I'm wondering whether we have cohort data on this particular age period in these behaviors to see whether, in fact, the, the, the high level of drinking um, risky sex and violence has now been extended to a later age in the 20s because the transition into these adult roles has been delayed. Well, actually, um, there's a lot of anecdotal data that, for example, uh, graduate students are now uh, continuing to drink as heavily as undergraduates and, you know, so that they're extending that period of, quote, emerging adulthood to later years. And um, I, there's definitely data to answer your question. I haven't looked at it, but we certainly could compare my graph that I did from the 2010 study to the 2001. And I'm sure, as you see, that, that uh, tapering off is not occurring at 25 anymore. It was still pretty high with the binge drinking into the 30s. So I'm sure you're right about that. I think it's a very interesting proposition, Larry, and, and uh, um, I can't report and say, yes, the data show that or the data don't. Like, I, I agree that the data are there and we could look at the cohort effects. Uh, I do know one cohort effect that I have found of interesting uh, in analyses that I've worked with has just been on the correlations among problem behaviors that actually in meta-analyses that I've done uh, that uh, a lot of the different problem behaviors were much more highly correlated in the 60s and 70s than they are today and that they're becoming a little less intercorrelated and a little more fragmented. And you've, I've also seen uh, in data I've done where uh, they're more highly correlated in adolescence younger adolescents than they are in older adolescents. So you see this, this fragmentation going on that way. But um, uh, again, that's one of the things I like so much about your talk is the importance of looking at cohort effects and just seeing the extent to which these processes are unique to a given cohort and the time that we're in versus being general uh, across cohorts. And I do think that's something that the field needs to take a much closer look at. I would add, I, I think that's a very important point also. Um, I would also add that given the impact that interpersonal injury has on marginalized youth of color, um, the trajectory for them has often been incarceration. So there's not a lot known, again, I, that's, that's just the challenge of it. Yeah, so I have- Remember to state your name for the oh, recording. Sure. Uh, Amanda Lattimore from uh, Johns Hopkins uh, Center for Adolescent Health. So I have more of a, a statement than a question, and Dr. Corbin was um, mentioning the, the need to, to really focus on young black men. Um, and so some of the work that we're doing with the Center for Adolescent Health addresses this uh, particular population, urban adolescents. And um, what we've found is one that we, mental health interventions in an urban uh, adolescent setting actually can work uh, and that the effects of violence um, are pervasive in urban adolescents, um, but that uh, if you do address their mental health issues, the trauma associated with violence in their communities and their homes, that you're able to decrease uh, depression and also improve employment outcomes. And this study was longitudinal. And so um, we are, young black men were particularly uh, um, 
uh, the effects of the intervention were particularly useful for young black men. So just wanted to share that. Uh, I think we, one more question, uh, and then we'll wrap up the session. Uh, Claire Brindis again. Um, my question is about positive deviants. And I've been wondering whether in your work you've come across young people growing up in these very difficult environments or in the area of sexuality or in the area of alcohol and drugs and marijuana where they're living in the same environments but somehow they've been able to navigate these waters without indulging or, you know, sort of being not just a resilient protectiveness but also just dealing with things more effectively. And can we learn about those situations or those split moment decisions around those individuals who are faced with the same environmental pressures? It sounds like that's an area that needs a lot of work. <laughs> and on that moment of silence, uh, we'll, we'll end the session. And thanks so much to our panelists. They were excellent.